So our speaker for today is our curate, uh, Erin Clifford. So would you please give a warm welcome to Erin. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning over at Onslow Square. Good morning to you here. Welcome to HTB. As uh, Miles said, we're in our series on 1 Corinthians 15. So if you want to open up your Bibles, grab one around you, we're on page 1166. 1166, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 20, page 1166 in your pew Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a human being, The resurrection of the dead comes also through a human being. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But in this order, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it's clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he's done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now if there's no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers and sisters, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Well, we're going to have some fun today, aren't we? Well, there's a story of a man who was flying across the United States in an airplane. And he stood up and he pulled a gun out of his pocket and he went over and took the stewardess, the flight attendant hostage, and he said to her, take me to Detroit, take me to Detroit. She looked kind of quizzically at him and said, we're going to Detroit. And he put the gun away and sat down and said, oh, good, good. He hadn't read the sign. He hadn't read where the destination was. The Corinthians were saying, is there a resurrection? Has there been a resurrection? We're not sure if we believe in this. And Paul was saying, the resurrection is your sign. This is a sign of where we're going. N.T. Wright says that, Any talk about the future in scripture is always a sign pointing into a bright mist. You've probably been on a country road in England and you see that sign pointing and you know that the sign isn't a picture of where you're going to end up. It's just a direction. It's just telling you which way to keep heading in. And Paul was saying that is what the resurrection is. It's a signpost of our future. The early Christians didn't believe in progress. They didn't believe that the world was getting better and better on its own. But nor did they believe that the world was getting worse and worse, and thus we should all look for an escape hatch, some way to escape it. They were asking the questions that we often ask today. Where is this all headed? Where is this all headed and who's in charge? Have you ever been into a classroom where the teacher's gone out and all of a sudden it's mayhem? You know, the children are um, on the chairs dancing around and, you know, throwing spitballs and paper airplanes and whatever else they do these days and probably texting. And you're thinking, who's in charge here? Who's in charge? Do you look around at the world and ask that question? Who's in charge? Sometimes we look at the injustice and the suffering in the world and we ask that Very genuine question. Who is in charge here? The Jews knew that God had to do something, that he had to intervene. And they knew that his kingdom was coming, but the question was when. 
And Paul was saying that the resurrection is the sign that that kingdom has come, but not in a way that you would expect. The Jews believed that all people would be raised at the end of history up to God. But what had happened instead in a very surprising, shocking way was one person had been raised in the middle of history, not at the end. And what Paul's saying is this is the beginning of the kingdom of God. It will come in two stages, Christ being resurrected and then when Christ comes again. And he uses that word order. And he says that there's an order of things that will happen. But he also means God is bringing order. That in the resurrection, God is beginning to bring order to what otherwise may seem a chaotic world. He's putting things in order. This is God's plan. God was going to do for the whole cosmos what he did for Jesus on Easter. This is our picture of the future. This is what the world was waiting for. Paul answers those two questions. Where is this all headed? And who's in charge? He answers those in the passage that we're looking at today. And he answers them by using a Greek word. This is our word of the day. Are we ready? Uh, The word is parousia. Okay, parousia. Let's all say it together. Parousia. No, no, you have to say it with an American accent. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Parousia. It's a Greek word. It was a common word at that time, and it had two meanings. And do you ever get in trouble, especially if you're from another country and you're living in England, do you ever get in trouble with the fact that some words mean something different where you come from? Well, I've certainly had that over the years that I've been here. My first real um, problem with this came one day when I would lived in London for about a year and I was looking for a job. I was looking for a place, to, a church to be clergy, to be a priest. And one day my friend called and she said, I've got a church and they're looking for someone and you should call the vicar. Um, but he's running, he's going out of town. You got to call him today. You got to call him this minute because tomorrow he literally leaves for holiday for a month. So I thought, okay, I'll call him. Well, I was running errands in Covent Garden, and it was a hot summer day, which doesn't usually happen, I know, in England. We haven't seen one of those for a while. I'm praying that in for the summer. Um, But it was a hot summer day. I was running errands, and I was dressed quite informally. I had a skirt on and a T-shirt and and flip-flops, okay? So I call him, and he's all the way in West London. And I say, hello, it's nice to meet you. Hello, it's lovely to meet you as well. And then I do something very American. I say, is this an all right time to call? And what I mean is, is this an okay time to be talking on the phone? But what he means in his very traditional um, British sense is, is this an okay time to visit in person? He, he, all of a sudden, he starts flummoxing and he goes, oh, um, uh, uh, well, yes, I guess it it would be okay for you to come by and here's my address. And, And he was off and running and I couldn't stop. And I'm looking down at what I'm wearing and I'm thinking, this is an interview to be a pastor of a church. Very inappropriate outfit. But I realize that I'm living in East London and there's no way I can get all the way to East London. I've got five buses or something I'd have to take to get all the way back by the time he could see me. So I went into the interview as I was, apologizing profusely. And during the interview, as he talked to me, every time he turned away, I tried to pull down my skirt, you know. And then afterwards, um, afterwards he said, I did get the job in the end, um, by the grace of God. But he said to his wife after I left, he said, well, I really like her. He said, she's American, and I'll forgive her for that. Um, but if she's going to be a priest at this church, she's gonna have to wear longer skirts. <sighs> and as you can see, I'm still taking that advice. <laughs> but lots of words have double meanings, and that's what Paul's saying here with this word parousia. So parousia was a common word for non-Christians as well, and the first meaning was of a divine presence. So if they felt a spirit or some divine presence of God appearing out of nowhere, then it was called a parousia the presence of God. The second meaning was a royal visit. So let's say that a king or an emperor went to go visit his people, went to travel in his land to remind them of who was emperor, who was in charge. This would have been called a parousia. And they would have been familiar with this. Caesar would have been doing this, would have been going and visiting his people in Philippi or in Corinth. And that was the second meaning of parousia. So when Paul uses that word here, when he says Christ will come, that's that's parousia, Christ will parousia, appear, He's using it purposefully because he's trying to tell us about what will happen. Where is this world headed and who's in charge? So the first thing he says that it's headed to God's presence. So Jesus, we know, is here with us in spirit, but he's not in body. 
We experience Christ through his word, as we're doing now, through the sacraments, communion, baptism, through his Holy Spirit. We experience him in prayer, in one another. It, the Bible even says we see Jesus in the face of the poor. But Jesus isn't with us here in body. But he will come back and we'll see him face to face. And for those of us who have known and loved Christ, loved Jesus, this will be like being face to face with someone that we've only known through letters, through emails, through phone calls. Communication theorists say that for us to communicate effectively, it can't just be through words. You can't have a, an effective relationship forever just through a letter. It often helps to have the phone, to have tone of voice. And then beyond that, it even helps to be in person for body language, to be able to communicate fully with someone. Well, have you ever had that experience? Maybe a pen pal that you met in person, or maybe even a blind date. So a few years ago, I had a blind date. Someone had set me up with this man, and we were talking on the phone, and we had emailed, and things were going really well, okay? So as most women do, we were meeting for the first time, and I thought, well, this is obviously the one. And, you know, he thinks we're having coffee. I think we're getting married. It's very normal. <laughs> and so we meet for the first time, and there was great expectation. You know, what will it be like to be in each other's presence for the first time? Because we were really hitting it off. Well, in the first two minutes of our conversation, it was obvious and mutual that this was to be the last time we would have coffee. <laughs> what we were like in person together was nothing like what we were like on the phone and over email. Well, this is not what it will be like with Jesus. What we've experienced of Christ now, his love, his peace, his presence, his healing power, multiply that by 10,000 trillion, trillion, trillion. That's what it'll be like to be in his presence. It's gonna be awesome, as we say in America. Trying to describe this love that we've only kind of felt now but will feel fully in person. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, for now we see only as a reflection in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Jesus is near us now in spirit, but he's absent in body. But one day we'll see him face to face. He's coming back. And this is part of the great recreative act of God. When heaven and earth will come together, will be face to face in a way that they never have been before, integrated completely with one another. That's when we will experience real parousia, the presence of God in a new way. And in a crazy way. <laughs> He says here, God will be all in all. And that tense there is future. It hasn't happened yet. Until the victory over evil, particularly over death, this moment hasn't arrived. Yes, God sustains this world by his love, in his wisdom, in his providence, but he doesn't overwhelm the world. He still allows us to make our choices. Paul is saying that God intends to fill all creation with his own presence and love. He'll be all in all. It's an amazing vision. Isaiah 11 says, the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. As the waters cover the sea. Now when I read that passage as a young person, I remember thinking, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but the waters in the sea, they're both water, and how does water cover the sea, and you know, how's this all gonna work? But it's like Isaiah's showing us that God intends to flood the whole universe with himself, as if the whole created world were designed as a receptacle for God's love and light and truth. He will be all in all. So where is all of this headed? Well, it's headed into the fullest presence of God that we've ever known, that the world was created for. And that is something to be excited about. That is gonna rock, okay? We're gonna be in Christ's presence in a way that we've never known. I am moving back actually to America after being here for seven years, I can't quite believe it. I'm moving back to go help Jamie Haith, who is one of our clergy here with his church in Virginia. You're all invited to come visit. And, uh, and 
I'm going back now after seven years, and my family is very excited, okay? I cannot, cannot overestimate how excited they are. And every time I call them, they say, well, how are you? And I say, well, I'm quite sad. You know, I mean, for good reason. I'm leaving great friends and a great church, and although it's all going to be very exciting there, of course I'm, you know, there's a part of me that's sad. Well, they won't hear anything of that, okay? They're just excited. They're just excited because my presence is going to be there with them. Now, I'm not saying that I'm Jesus, but I'm saying we've all felt that, felt that sense of someone we love and knowing we're going to be near them. It's going to be like that. God is going to be in all. Paul says that this resurrection is the signpost of that, that Jesus himself will be present. As well, he's going to be the agent and the transformation it's going to be a part of that change, making that change happen in the world. N.T. Wright says, the whole world is waiting on tiptoe with expectation for the moment when that resurrection life and power sweeps through it, filling it with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That's pretty awesome. So that's where we're headed. The second question is, who's in charge? Who's in charge? Who's reigning until that happens. And so Paul uses that word parousia again. You're never going to forget this word. <sighs> parousia. And he means it in the, in the case of a royal visit. He also means it in the second meaning. And he's making a political statement. Because again, this word would have normally been used for Caesar coming to see his people. But now Paul is saying the one true Lord, the one true emperor is coming to visit. He's coming to show the world that he is the one who reigns. The once absent ruler is coming to remind the world that he is actually the one before whom all other emperors will bow down in fear and worship. Well, what would it look like for you to be in charge? <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? What would it be look like if you ran the world? Or maybe even just this country, maybe just a country. What would be your political platform? Maybe you have run for office, or you're one of those people that in school growing up, you wanted to be head girl or head boy or class president because you had great political aspirations, and you had dreams for what you would want to change about that place, goals. What would be your platform, your goal in reigning? Well, Jesus is reigning, and he has a goal. He has a purpose, and it's to defeat all the enemies that have defaced and oppressed his creation. Not only his earthly creation, but his human creation. You know, matter and evil, the world is all good. Matter is good. It's not evil. But rebellion we see in the world all around us. And that is what the world is enslaved to. That's what God is coming to free us from. Redemption in God's eyes doesn't mean scrapping everything. We sometimes think about that when we think of when Christ comes again. He's not going to scrap everything and start from a clean slate. But he is coming to liberate the things that have been enslaved. We see this on a small scale in our own lives. When we've come to follow Christ, we were made free. And if you're here today and you don't know God in that way, Jesus in that way, anyone can be free. Anyone can experience the hope of Christ. But we've experienced that in our own lives. But one day Christ will do that for the whole world, for the whole creation. Death is the ultimate sign of that slavery. Death is the enemy, Paul says in this passage. Well, that's something obvious to any of us who've lost someone we love. Death is the enemy. To anyone who's been bereaved, we understand this idea. You know, we downplay death. We don't talk about it much. It doesn't come up at dinner parties. We often ignore it. We rarely talk about it. But death is not a part of God's goodness. It's not a part of his beauty and power. Not a part of God's ultimate creation. And the point of the resurrection is the defeat of death. So we go back to this Genesis image. Paul wants us to be holding Genesis chapters 1 to 3 as we're holding 1 Corinthians 15. And he talks about creation and he goes back to Adam. And he says, through Adam all have become enslaved to sin. All have died. 
he says. But through Christ and Christ's resurrection, all are freed, all live. If death is the unmaking of God's creation, resurrection will be its remaking. This is the Christian hope in which we live. This is the sign of the resurrection. So God has won the battle, the greater battle, as we know, on the cross. But we experience daily battles, don't we? We're not free from that. And even Paul wanted to make sure that they understood that this is a reality of just being a human being, of following Jesus now before that time has come when he returns, those daily battles. And so he says there that he has fought with wild beasts. I love that little verse in there that we read. He's fought with wild beasts. Now, it's likely that he hadn't literally fought with wild beasts, that he wouldn't have been thrown in as a gladiator because he was a Roman citizen and they wouldn't have had to do that. But he's using a metaphor for the battle he experiences in the gospel within that culture, the oppression that he's experienced trying to live this life and this truth of the resurrection every day. He's telling them he understands and he's saying that if there was no resurrection, if it's not true, then why has he done this? Why has he gone to all this effort? It's not worth it. And he moves here from this idea of doctrine to ethics. He's now saying, how do we live out this resurrection in the day to day? And he hits on two things which I think we do all the time. When we look into the future and we can't tell what's gonna happen, when it looks dark, when it looks unknown, I think we go to two extremes. The first extreme is the one that he points out first about the baptism of the dead. The extreme of wanting to secure the world around us. When we don't know what's coming, we start to panic. We start to say, okay, well let me make sure that no, I have every contingency in place because I don't know what's in the future and I'm fearful. Let me just secure everything around me. And that phrase about them baptizing the dead, it's a confusing phrase. We don't, historians don't totally know exactly what they were doing. But it was either that they were actually pulling up people who had died and baptizing them because they hadn't been already, or friends and family were being baptized on behalf of those they loved who died. But either way, they were trying to secure the spiritual life in the future. They were panicking. I think we do that. The other extreme we go to is the one he talks about here, where he says, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And that came from an, an ancient popular moral which gladiators would often say to themselves before they went into the ring. It was an encouragement to drink in anticipation of approaching death. What's it all for? I like to call this living life in the shorthand. Are you living life in the shorthand? People say, well, life is short. I say, life is short. I agree. But life is precious. It's too short. It's too short to live like it doesn't matter. It's too short to live like our bodies don't matter, like our relationships don't matter, like our words don't matter. Ultimately, like God doesn't matter. Paul says, bad company corrupts good character. Ironically, he's quoting there from a Greek poet, a pagan poet. The church was letting their neighbors, their cultural neighbors, distort the truth of the gospel. They were questioning this resurrection because everyone else around them was questioning this. They were saying, this is crazy. This is crazy talk. And Paul isn't saying to leave the company of people who aren't Christians. He's definitely not saying that. But he's saying, don't let the people around you change the way you live out what you truly believe. Don't let the crowd that you're hanging around with influence your worldview into something that no longer resembles the truth of the resurrection, the hope in which you live. He says to them, stop sinning, which I always think is a really strange thing to throw in at the end of this discourse about the resurrection. Stop sinning. But what he's saying is all of life is connected. All of it is interwoven. Bill talked about this last week. What we think affects how we live. And Paul's reiterating that again. I always say, if you want to know what someone believes about God, listen to how they pray. As they pray, do they believe that God is a, a big God, full of compassion and grace, a forgiving God? Well, I think the same is true about our lives. What we believe about God shows in how we live. 
If someone looked at how we live, would they say, oh, they know about their future. Their future is secure. They hope in something beyond themselves. The resurrection gives the future meaning, but it also gives our present meaning, value. Does my life reveal a true understanding of this one true God? Jesus is risen. Therefore, the world, the new world has begun. Jesus is risen, therefore, all of us have a chance to be free. And Jesus is risen, therefore, his followers have a new job. God has begun a new project, and he calls us to be a part of it. Now, if I were him, I would have chosen something different, as I often say. You know, I mean, I, you know, I probably would have skipped me, skipped Miles. Yeah, I would have chosen you all, because you're clearly very clever. Very good-looking group here this morning. But God chose all of us, all different shapes and sizes, all different experiences, all different giftings, all different backgrounds. He chose us to be a part of his new project of bringing the kingdom now of bringing the life of heaven to birth in actual, physical, earthly reality. It's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The resurrection is more than a proof that God does miracles, although it is. It's more than a proof that the Bible is true, although it is. It's more than a proof that we can know Jesus Now that we can have assurance of life after death, although it is. It's a sign of the beginning of God's new project. To bring the life of heaven to earth. Notice that Paul doesn't end 1 Corinthians 15 by saying, Well, all right, folks, since we've got this uh, really good hope in the future, let's all just take a nap, you know? Let's all just wait until God comes back. Because it's all about the future. The present doesn't matter. No, that's not what he says. There at the end of chapter 15, he says, so get on with your work because you know that in the Lord, it won't go to waste. This means that every act of love, every deed done in Christ and by the Spirit, every true work of creativity, every time justice is done, peace is made, families are healed, Temptations are resisted. True freedom is sought and won. We're declaring the resurrection again and again and again. And we're actively anticipating that new creation. We become living signposts of hope, pointing people in the direction of God and the future with God. I'll end with this. Uh, experience I had on a plane recently, which some of you have probably had before. You're on a plane, it's an early morning flight, and the sun is rising on one side of the plane. And isn't that an amazing experience (laughs) to see the sun rise from an airplane just above the clouds? But the other side is total darkness. And if you're on this side of the plane, you can't tell that the sun is rising over here. There's no evidence that that's happening at the same time. And isn't life like that sometimes? Sometimes we're on this side of the plane and we can see hope. We can see that resurrection hope on the horizon. Sometimes we're on this side and all seems dark. We don't know when that hope is coming. But it doesn't matter which side of the plane you're sitting on. We're still going in the same direction. It doesn't matter what we feel or experience in this life. It's all headed in the same direction. It doesn't change God's plan. The world is headed into the fullest presence of God that it's ever known and that it was created for. And Jesus is reigning and will overcome death that we might live in hope. This is the hope of the gospel. This is the sign of the resurrection. Should we pray? Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for the resurrection. We thank you, God, for how this has changed history. This moment when you rose from the grave has changed the whole story. 
It's infused hope into a story that was hopeless. So God, we thank you for that. But God, it's easy to get entrenched into what's going on in our day to day. It's so easy to lose sight of where we're going. It's so easy to be distracted by what's out the window. We forget that you're still flying the plane. So God, we again ask you to give us your bigger perspective, your eternal perspective. God, may that help us to be faithful with our lives now, to live out your purpose for us in a genuine, in our genuine human lives. May we be a part of reconciliation and forgiveness. Show us places where we can bring healing and hope. And Lord, start with us. Fill us with your hope. Fill us with your Holy Spirit's presence, your presence with us today. Jesus' name, amen.